Hi there. Welcome back to the Garut Podcast. I hope all of you have been enjoying the podcast episodes so far, and I hope you continue to support the podcast. Uh, just as a, before, I have a humble request to all of the viewers to please subscribe to the channel, as this will enable me to invite more and more guests on the show. This is the seventh episode of the podcast. I can't even believe it that we have been able to conduct seven episodes already. Now, in the sixth episode of the podcast, I got a chance to have a conversation with a former fighter pilot who was working as a F-18 Super Hornet pilot in the U.S. Navy. Even in this episode, I also got a chance to have a conversation with a person who was working in the space of military aviation. My next guest here is Mr. Kenneth Cass, who was working as a former flight test engineer for the United States Air Force. He worked on some of the most sophisticated aircraft operated by the Air Force. He worked on the V-52 Bomber, the V-22 Osprey, and even the Boeing Chinook. We got a chance to talk, also got a chance to talk about his time at MIT, uh, some of the, uh, the book he wrote about the B, uh, the B-2 Bomber, and we also got a chance to talk about the future of military aviation. Lastly, before we begin the podcast, uh, I also have a request to all the viewers to please place your comments uh, or any sort of feedback you might have about the podcast in the comment section. This will enable me to further improve the coming episodes of the podcast and improve the quality of the content which is being uh, shown in the podcast. I hope you continue to support this podcast, and I hope you enjoy the next episode of the GERD podcast. Let's begin. Okay. So, um, yeah, hi. Um, what, so welcome, Mr. Kenneth, to the uh, GERD podcast. I'm so happy you accepted my invitation. Thank you. Um, yeah, and, yeah, and I'm so happy. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for getting up so early uh, and, uh, yeah, coming to uh, record this episode. So um, yeah, so my guest here is Mr. Kenneth. So Mr. Kenneth is a former um, pilot and officer for the United States Air Force, and he has uh, received a bachelor's degree from MIT uh, in aeronautics and astronautics. And uh, Mr. Kenneth has also has a master's degree in aerospace engineering and manufacturing from the University of Michigan. Um, Mr. Kenneth began his career as an officer in the United States Air Force. So while he was working for the United States Air Force, he planned numerous test missions. So he planned, um, he analyzed and he planned numerous test missions, which included data of cruise missile programs. Um, he also flew the B-52 Stratofortress during these test missions. And he was also, uh, after working for the Air Force, he was working as a flight test engineer for Boeing. So during this time, he flew the um, V-22 Osprey and the CH-47 Chinook. And afterwards, he was working as a manager of business development uh, at Honeywell and a director of business and product development at Bisspace Incorporation. Um, most importantly, right now, he's working as a principal engineer at Collins Aerospace. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much. And so, uh, yeah, it seems like you've worked on a lot of uh, sophisticated and celebrated aircraft uh, at the United States Air Force and also while you were working at Boeing. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm excited to talk about some of the work you've been involved with and some of the airplanes you've been working with. Yeah. Um, so uh, just to begin, I, I just kind of wanted to know about like uh, your time at MIT. So like MIT is like a think tank for innovation and uh, like groundbreaking development. And it has a huge um, department for aeronautics and astronautics. And uh, also, like, did you work on any projects at MIT focused on aeronautics and astronautics? Well, I went to MIT quite a while ago. We're talking about uh, 40 years ago. I 
I, I did work on several projects. Um, one of them was at the Space Systems Laboratory, where um, I helped uh, the Space Systems Laboratory do research uh, or oriented towards the use of automation in space and and how um, automation and human beings could could best work together in space. And I believe that some of that research would eventually feed into things like the space station assembly. Uh, although although that, that was long before we were actually doing space station assembly, but uh, I think that those went into considerations of how you would use both people and robots, in this case, the, the, the arm on the shuttle to go yes. together. Um, we also had various uh, projects that were part of our coursework and uh, the, the capstone design project that I had in my senior year had to do with designing one option for replacement space shuttle. So we looked okay. at, at different options for uh, uh, how the space shuttle might be replaced and selected one and explored it at, at some detail. Okay. Okay. Yeah, like the um the space station project seems to be like uh seems to be quite exciting. <laughs> and yeah, it was like yeah, the space station was like built a long a long long time ago. Yeah, I think so. Um yeah, and I I've heard briefly that they might be considering to dismantle it, right? In like in a few in some time or I think that the space shuttle supposedly I think is going to be decommissioned around 2030 is what I've read, but I haven't been involved with the space station. Sure. And and this is, sure. you know, I just read the same things that everybody else reads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, like, um, I briefly mentioned before that, uh, like, you were working for um, the United States Air Force. So, uh, like, what made you, so was this immediately after your uh, master's at Michigan or, like, no, no, I went through MIT on a program called ROTC, which is the Reserve Officer Training Corps, and it was military training while I was in uh, MIT. I was commissioned as an Air Force officer afterwards, and, and, and to slightly correct your introduction, I was not a pilot in the Air Force. I was a flight test sure. engineer in the Air Force. Um, yeah. I reported to Edwards Air Force Base uh, several months after I uh, graduated from MIT. Okay, okay. Yeah. And um, so uh, just like you said right now, like you were um, a flight test engineer at the at the Air Force. Um, like, could you just briefly kind of describe like what kind of work you were involved uh, like as a flight test engineer? Yeah, well, generally flight test engineers are involved with the planning, conduct and analysis of flight tests. In particular, I was assigned to a group called the Strategic Systems Combined Test Force, which was later became known as the 6519th Test Squadron. That unit still exists yeah. today. It's known as the 419th Flight Test Squadron. That Its designation was changed after uh, I had left military service. Our responsibility okay. at the time was uh, the B-52 and things that were associated with the B-52, primarily cruise missiles. We tested several different mm -hmm. kinds of cruise missiles, and and that also included the avionics upgrades associated with those cruise missiles. Okay. And uh, so, so you said like um, while you were at MIT uh, through the Reserve Corps program, you like uh, what underwent some military training. Uh, so, like, what kind of training was this? Like, to did you have to undergo to like perform your duties at the Air Force? Well, the ROTC program was not to create flight test engineers. It was just basic officer training. So we had a class um, that we took every uh, uh, week associated with just basic uh, fundamentals of being an Air Force officer. We had a, a uh, an assembly of all the cadets on, if I recall, Wednesday afternoon. We would meet for Saturday morning on drill. And then in between my second and third year, we had a uh, uh, camp of, I vaguely remember it was four weeks, maybe it was eight weeks. I, I, I just don't remember, it was a long time ago. Uh, that was also mm -hmm. officer training. And then uh, having completed all that, we were commissioned uh, 
uh, when we uh, right after we graduated. And that was before mm -hmm. University of Michigan. I attended the University of Michigan actually later in life after um, I had uh, completed my military service and then worked at Boeing and then I attended University of Michigan. So I was about 30 years old and I attended that 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 okay. university. OK, OK. And uh, um, just at like the University of Michigan, uh, like what was your thesis? Like, can you briefly talk about it? Like what kind of research you were involved with? Uh, at at the Michigan? University of Michigan, um, I received a ma uh, two master's degrees, actually. And yeah. um, the in the program in aeronautics and astronautics, there wasn't a thesis. It was it was classwork and it was focused on sure. flight dynamics and control. In the course, in the other program I took, which was manufacturing, um, we had a project that was essentially a thesis. I worked with the Ford Motor Company, the, the car company, and they were looking at um, inertial sensors for uh, controlling cars, basically uh, solid state gyroscopes. And we did some work for them associated with trying to analyze what might be the cost to manufacture those uh, uh sensors okay okay yeah yeah that's that sounds interesting for sure yeah yeah it was uh, interesting yeah. because um, automotive is an application that's much more cost sensitive than aerospace so yes, uh, you know uh, uh, cars simply don't cost anything like what aircraft cost yeah. so um, yeah. the sensors had to be very very low cost relative to the cost that you would be willing to accept in an aerospace application. OK. And um, so uh, like like you said before, like you were a flight test engineer um, in, in, the, in the Air Force and then shortly after at Boeing as well. So um, like one thing I've just always uh, I've just been like curious to know about is um, like what what is like flight test data like even uh like airbus or some of the other manufacturers as well um like whenever they're testing airplanes uh like they're gathering flight test data before it is um it is certified to fly safely um like could you just pr please briefly describe like what is flight test data and um like how how did you also like plan some of these test missions okay well let's start off with planning test missions you have in, in, in we were testing a experimental missile called tacit rainbow it was classified at the time but has since um been uh, declassified in fact you can see one hanging up in the air force museum it was a small cruise missile we had a certain number of missiles that were part of the program and and we had to figure out so so the, the number of test missions we had essentially was the number of missiles. You also could have various missions where you didn't launch the missile. But in terms of launches, and you had as many launches as you had missiles. So you had, on the mm -hmm. one hand, uh, uh, so many missiles. And on the other hand, you had test objectives that you had to meet. And so the question was, how did you accomplish either all the objectives or at least the highest priority ones with the number of missiles that you had. It wasn't always clear that you could do everything that you wanted because you only have a limited number of test um, missiles, which means a limited number of test missions since the missile is expended at the end of the mission. So we would look at the um, uh, requirements and we would look at the number of missiles and we would uh, apportion them out. Now, it wasn't just a question of, 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 of requirements and spreading them out over. There also was a progression. You wanted to start at the most benign conditions and then work your way up to the most challenging. So there was a certain order that things had to be on. So we would come up with a, a design for each of the missions. And that would include um, what targets we were going after and 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 what ranges we would use and what would be the launch aircraft and the launch conditions and then what would be the flight path and the flight path would uh, uh, hopefully allow us to meet various mission objectives we put that all together and we had a plan 
Um, then when we went off to test, we would have um, the aircraft, of course, in the air. We had a, a, a mission control uh, a room, really a small room at Edwards Air Force Base involved with the launch. And then we had we would typically fly up at the uh, at China Lake, which is actually a Navy facility. And so we would have a, another control room up at China Lake that would act, would would lead the mission. And uh, in terms of data, there were a lot of different sources of data that we would use. Um, one source of data was the the B-52 um, was instrumented both in terms of its avionics system and also other parameters on board like a camera to record the separation of the vehicle. So you had onboard data from the aircraft. Then you had um, the missile um, had a telemetry package on it in place of the warhead. It didn't have a warhead during test. It had a telemetry package. So you were getting telemetry off of the missile. That was um, that was a, a broadcast from the missile and recorded on the ground. Then you had um, ground tracking data of the missile, uh, which provided an independent, uh, you typically using a, a radar during the, during the flight. And so you had a tracking radar and you had a beacon on board the missile that uh, acted as a transponder for the tracking radar. So you had a, a reference for where the missile actually was as opposed to where the missile uh, broadcast down where where it uh, had calculated where it was and you could calculate navigation error there in addition when the missile entered the terminal attack zone against the target there were um, optical sensors there that tracked the missile so you could determine how accurately it hit so you put those okay. all together and that was the data that you had from the b-52 mm -hmm. from the missile and from the the range and you use that to reconstruct what happened and analyze the performance of the weapon system. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so it sounds like a, um, a very meticulous and like thought out process when you're conducting test missions. Right, I mean, the, the whole point of a mission, of a test mission is to learn. One of the misperceptions that people have is that a test is a success based on whether the article under test is successful. That's not always the case. Um, a, a test mission is successful because you you learned what you wanted to learn, that you've recovered the data and were able to analyze it. Also, a test mission is successful if if nobody uh, gets hurt or killed. But sometimes the 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 missile won't work properly, and and as long as you understand, um, as long as you gather data and can use that to um, feed back to the design team what didn't work right, that's uh, that's considered an acceptable test. Okay, yeah. And um, like just as a as a follow up question, so um, like I briefly mentioned before, so uh, at Boeing, uh, I believe you were testing the V twenty two Osprey and the CH forty seven. Um, so these are obviously like rotor craft. So like I'm, uh, I'm just assuming that they're a little bit different from uh, what you were testing at the Air Force. So like, um, how did these flight tests uh, differ from what you were working at the Air Force? You know, that's an interesting question. Obviously, the vehicle types are different. On the other hand, and, and there's certain, there's certain. Um, there are obviously some differences. For example, a missile doesn't have a person on board and a missile is, is expended in, in, over the course of the mission, whereas uh, a V-22 Osprey has a crew on board and is not expended, of course. And then, and then there, there are obvious differences between a, a tilt rotor or a helicopter on the one hand and a, and a missile on the other hand, as you pointed out. On the other hand, they're all flight vehicles. They're all subjected to the same physics, and the basic principles of flight testing remain the same. So I would say, in general, there was more similarity than differences, even though obviously mm -hmm. the vehicles are, are are different. Great, great. And um, so, so just like you said, um, like most of the uh, aircraft or what weapon systems you're testing are. 
um, facing like the same sort of physics or like similar conditions. But um, is military aircraft testing um, more different than like civilian aircraft testing or um, I'm like just based on what you said, it would almost be the same, right? Well, the V-22, of course, is a military aircraft, even though I mean, it's developed by industry, but it is a military aircraft. However, more broadly, again, there are certain specific differences because military aircraft need to meet military requirements, whereas civilian aircraft need to meet uh, civil certification requirements that are put out by airworthiness agencies like the Federal Aviation Administration, as well as the requirements established by the manufacturers so that they can meet customer needs, for example, things like uh, performance and range and fuel economy. But again, although there are some differences there, um, fundamentally flight testing um, has the same principles, whether you're talking about a military program or a civilian program. Okay. You know, Okay. Same things having to do with yeah. risk mitigation, uh, flight test data, uh, how you plan and organize a, uh, a test mission. Those things are basically the same. And people are able to move back and forth between military and civil work uh, fairly easily. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so, like, uh, we talked about, like, a, a range of aircraft, like, you've worked on um, the B-52, uh, the B-22 Osprey, um, and even the CH-47. So, uh, which which aircraft did you enjoy working on the most, like, of all these? Well, I enjoyed them all. Um, the V-22 has a special place with me because it was it was not just a new kind, it was not just a new kind of aircraft, it was a whole new category of aircraft. I mean, there had been tilt rotors before. There had been the, the Bell XV-3 and the Bell XV-15. But this was the first uh, prop rotor or, or, or tilt rotor type aircraft that had ever been designed for production. So um, it, there was a particular excitement in, in working on something that was so new. So that, that's kind of my favorite. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Yeah, like um the V twenty two Osprey is like also shown in like a lot of movies, like especially in Hollywood, um, when they uh, have like certain scenes from the military, this aircraft is shown um quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting and, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um so uh I, I believe you uh wrote in uh, a publication uh, about autonomous drone systems. And uh, so, like, the Air Force has acquired, like, quite a few advanced drones. Like, um, for instance, it has acquired the RQ-170, I believe, and, like, there's, uh, there's like, so many more. Um, so, so based on, like, your publication and, uh, like, just your experience with drones, um, like, what do you think has, like, advanced uh, remotely piloted aircraft in the Air Force and like what has kind of like retarded those systems? That's a good question. It's a pretty broad question. The the paper that you're referring to was a paper that I wrote for Society of Flight Test Engineers yeah. Conference about a decade ago. And it looked sure. at the early history of Air Force remote piloted vehicles, basically from the beginning all the way up to about the year 2000. And so you say autonomous, but most of those systems, some of those systems were autonomous, but most of those systems were not autonomous in any way. They were remotely piloted. So there's a pilot that remains or a vehicle operator that remains in the loop. They're just not on board the aircraft. Um, the okay. aircraft, the, the Air Force or its predecessor, the Army, has been using um, remote piloted aircraft since the late 1930s, really around and then starting, let's say, around 1940. Originally, they were used as aerial targets, and what they were, were was was a large model airplane that was used uh, for gunnery practice, and that's how it got started. Then after World War II, um, they realized that if they wanted to have a realistic target, it couldn't be a little propeller-powered airplane. It had to be a, a jet-powered aircraft, and so... Uh, the aerial targets moved from propeller powered to jet powered with much higher performance. Somebody's thought 
wouldn't it be interesting if we put a navigation system and a camera on this remote piloted drone, on this remote pilot, so we could um, use it for reconnaissance? And that was um, something that was being looked at and, and, and took a particular urgency after the U-2 uh, flown by Francis Gary Powers was shot down over the Soviet Union in 1960. Um, we needed to look at alternatives, and there were several different alternatives that were explored, one of which was using a, a drone with a camera on it. Now, remember that these were not video cameras that were beaming back uh, real-time video back then. These were cameras that um, had film, and so the vehicle had to fly out, then fly back and be recovered to look at the film. The second option that was being looked at was a very high-speed manned airplane. That became the uh, Lockheed A-12 bl uh, Blackbird, yeah. uh, or codename Oxcart, which eventually evolved into the famous SR-71. The third option was using satellites in space. Now, the, the remote piloted aircraft option was a variation of the Ryan Firebee. And those aircraft were used heavily uh, during the Vietnam War for reconnaissance over North Vietnam. They had advantages and disadvantages during that time. Um, it, the program uh, ended up being successful, but it still had a lot of problems. One of the biggest problems they had was navigation. Um, this was, of course, an era before GPS and before you had miniaturized inertial navigation systems. So the aircraft were basically doing dead reckoning with a compass and with, uh, with, a, uh, um, with an indication of ground speed. They just weren't very accurate. And a lot of times they just missed the target. And if they missed the target, you came back and you got uh, a roll of film that the camera had taken pictures on, but there was nothing in there of interest. It just was flying over someplace. So navigation was an issue. Another issue was the reliability of the vehicles. They had a tendency to crash sometimes. Uh, another, yet another problem was that the vehicles had to be recovered to get the film, and sometimes they yeah. weren't recovered. Or the vehicles, um, uh, uh, you know, they 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 land. They didn't land on a runway. They were air launched off of a C-130, and then they would uh, pop a parachute over the recovery zone, and when they uh, hit the ground, they could get damaged. Eventually, they started doing a mid-air recovery with helicopters, but that didn't always work. So you had a system that had a great advantage, which is that you could fly it over heavily defended airspace, and if it lost, you didn't lose an air crew member. On the other hand, you had issues with navigation accuracy, reliability, uh, uh, the return of the vehicle. It had to be returned. In other words, if it got shot down, you weren't going to get the film back. Yeah. and then uh, reuse the vehicle because it could be damaged. So there was uh, uh, some real operational value here. On the other hand, there were uh, considerable constraints. After the Vietnam War, the Air Force had a lot of plans to, um, uh, to uh, continue with this kind of vehicle. But uh, by the end of the 1970s, they were all canceled. Um, the aircraft, the Air Force moved more towards manned aircraft. Also, satellites had gotten much better. So uh, the, uh, you, you started to have satellites like the KH-11 Kennan, which could uh, return pictures in real time from space. They didn't have film anymore, which had to be recovered from space. So um, these uh, drones largely went away in the Air Force, and, and they came back and ended up with what we would have to uh, eventually be called things like Predator and Global Hawk, largely because of space technology. So what happened? You got GPS, so they could navigate much more accurately. You had satellite data links. With satellite data links, you could, re re um, you could uh, return um, uh, reconnaissance information, pictures, electronic surveillance, radar in, in real time. You didn't have to wait till it came back um, and you recovered the vehicle and, and got the film. So that made it much more useful, much more responsive. I mean, in addition, the new vehicles could be taken off and landed on a runway and therefore mm -hmm. didn't require a C-130 to air launch them and mm -hmm. a helicopter to recover them. So they were simply operationally much simpler. Mm 
And of course, since then, those uh, those vehicles have gone on to be heavily used in combat operations and continue to be developed. Yes. Okay. So that's a that's a quick summary of what the paper was all. About. Sure, sure. Yeah, like um, yeah, like drones have uh, definitely come like a long way. Like every single country is um, like working very hard to kind of advance their drone systems. Like, sure. yeah, yeah. Like, um, but uh, do you do you just worry that they they like can they be uh, obviously they can be misused? But like as drones get more and more advanced, like especially during the. Uh, uh, like like right now with the Russia Ukraine war as well, um, some of the drone technologies are being um, like quote unquote misused. Like, does that worry you a little bit? Or oh sure, I mean any but any weapon can be you know weapons are are dangerous bad things. Um, you know countries buy them to meet military purposes, but any weapon can be misused. There's a particular concern with autonomous systems because if you don't have a human being in the loop. Yeah, I mean now, you know, uh, how do you how do you control this? How do you prevent it from doing bad things? So, um, generally, even an autonomous system, you would want to have a human being in the loop to consent, for example, to weapons delivery. You know, you might have a vehicle that could fly out autonomously, but before it actually launches a weapon, you would want to have a human being uh, consent to uh, approve weapons release and, and target engagement. So yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously there's a concern with this, uh, with this class of weapon system. Okay. But uh, I must say that sometimes I think that people overdo it. Any weapon system is, is problematic. Yeah, right, right. Um, so uh, in like on your uh, LinkedIn profile as well, like you've talked a lot about um, Scrum and like ag agile testing, and um, I actually briefly took a course uh, about this uh, recently in the last term. Um, so, uh, like, could you just briefly talk about like uh, how how have you used it just like uh, throughout uh, some with some of your work and especially in like information technology and um, like, just what are some of the applications of like Scrum or Agile testing? Well, my my career started in aerospace, and then around the year 2000, I moved into information technology, and I worked in information technology until 2020. So, about half my career has been in aerospace, and about half my career has been in information technology. Yeah. The period that I worked in information technology coincided with the uh, widespread adoption of Agile principles within uh, information technology. Um, Agile has a lot of advantages because it, it the, the essence of Agile development is that it's iterative and incremental. And essentially, you can adapt as you go along and develop because you learn more. And uh, you also get to uh, deploy some set of capabilities earlier in the program instead of having it as one big plan. Also, there's the belief, I think largely correct, that you can never fully define the requirements up front. And so it, with Agile, you don't need to def fully define the requirements up front. You can de define some small requirements, build something, and then as you go along, evolve into what the requirements actually are, as well as how they have, uh, uh, you know, you can prioritize them and also just simply in improve your understanding as you go along. Um, that has worked very well in general. Um, the problem is, is that translating that into aerospace, in theory, that ought to work very well with aerospace. Um, in reality, it's not so simple. Aerospace um, tends to have uh, contracts that are defined uh, around, built around uh, an upfront definition of requirements. Well, that's somewhat incompatible with the whole Agile approach because all the requirements are defined up front. And then when you want to change those requirements, there's a whole change of scope process. Uh, the problem is, is that now you've introduced this complex change of scope process, which gets into the contracts every time you want to do an iteration. So it makes Agile very difficult for the typical aerospace contract. Also, 
aerospace um, uh, programs tend to be um, um, require a basis of certification for software. That's something called DO-160C these days. Excuse me, DO-178C, and then for firmware um, for uh, in 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 hardware like uh, field programmable gate arrays, also known as FPGAs. There's another standard called DO-254. Those are very, very detailed and prescriptive uh, uh, basis of certification for those things. There's nothing that's inherently incompatible with Agile. However, the way that most organizations have defined their processes for development and testing and verification and certification is, is very much uh, a traditional one pass through where you do all the requirements up front rather than a more iterative model so it becomes difficult in practice to apply Agile to aerospace programs. And we need to overcome that because clearly there are advantages to doing Agile. But uh, okay. it's not simple. Yeah. Okay. And um, so uh, the, the next thing I just kind of wanted to talk about was uh, your book. So like in uh, some of the other podcasts you've been featured in, uh, a lot of people have talked about your book. And it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely a great read uh, about the B1 Lancer. So um, the B1 Lancer, like in itself, it's like, it's it's a very, it's a very fearsome aircraft. Um, it tends to reach very, very high speeds. Uh, and uh, I believe it can carry nuclear weapons. Uh, I think so. And um uh, just, like just for some context, like what encouraged you to write this book about this about this airplane? Well, about I've had an interest and fascination in this air uh, in this airplane for about 50 years. When I grew up, the father of my best friend was an engineer working on the B1 program, so I've, yeah. I've been following it for the last 50 years. But it's it's a very interesting story. The more I got into it, the story of the B-1 actually starts in the 1950s when the Air Force decide was trying to understand what would replace the B-52 bomber, which was only then entering service, and already they were looking at something to replace it. They looked at multiple different concepts. One concept was a bomber that would be uh, supersonic. The second was a bomber, and, 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 and all these concepts would carry nuclear weapons. The second one was, an, was, was a bomber that actually was not just nuclear armed, but nuclear powered. And the third one was what we would today call the intercontinental ballistic missile. Now, we're not going to further talk about the intercontinental ballistic missile and the nuclear powered airplane. Those sort of go off in their own directions. Of course, the intercontinental ballistic mm -hmm. missile remains to this day and eventually became the basis of the space program. Uh, nuclear powered bombers, we spent a lot of money on them, but uh, in the end that never went anywhere. The, the, the concept of a supersonic bomber eventually became the B-70 Valkyrie, a, a Mach 3 airplane. Um, that was not a very practical airplane, only two prototypes, the XB-70As were actually flown the, pro, the program never went into production. It just wasn't a practical airplane. Um, after the uh, B-70 program was, was essentially, it was decided that that was not going to go into production, um, the Air Force sat down and figured out what kind of, okay, uh, that didn't work, so what kind of bomber should we actually buy? And whereas the B-70 had been oriented towards flying very high and very fast, the problem, and we're now talking about the early 1960s, um, that turned out to be the wrong solution. First of all, to fly at Mach 3 was just too expensive. You had to build airplanes out of exotic materials um, and introduce a lot of complexities. So you didn't want to have an airplane that threw Mach 3. The other problem is, is that however high and fast you could make a bomber, uh, unless it had a low radar cross section, you could always make a surface to air missile that could fly higher and faster yet. The, the actual key to penetrating Soviet airspace, and we're talking about now in the early 1960s, was to fly low because uh, their air defense systems didn't work at low altitudes. So the focus became flying low more than on flying high and fast. Uh, during the 1960s, there was a lot of controversy about whether the Air Force should move ahead with this program. The Air Force wanted to do so. 
However, the Secretary of Defense at the time, a man named Robert McNamara, didn't feel felt that in the missile age, bombers were somewhat redundant and antiquated. While he supported keeping a few of the old bombers around uh, just as kind of a backup, he didn't think that the Air Force needed a brand new bomber. Um, eventually, the administration changed. There was a new Secretary of Defense, and that Secretary of Defense agreed with the Air Force that they should want to go ahead with a bomber. The program was called the AMSA, A-M-S-A, or the Advanced Manned Strategic Aircraft, and that airplane became the B-1. It was an airplane that had um, a variable geometry wings or swing wings, and that enabled the airplane to, on the one hand, go uh, to take off and land using a modest distance, to fly low alto, very low altitude terrain following flight, yet also to fly at, uh, at at medium or high altitude at about Mach 2. So very broad envelope uh, because of the uh, um, uh, variable geometry wings. The airplane uh, built on the technological legacy of the F-111, which was a uh, variable geometry fighter. Um, the B-1, uh, was uh, full-scale development of the Advanced Manned Strategic Aircraft, which became known as the B-1, uh, began around 1970. Uh, uh, North American Rockwell, later called Rockwell International, became the prime contractor for the B-1. They beat out General Dynamics, and they also beat out Boeing for that contract. The prime contract for the engines went to General Electric, uh, which beat out Pratt & Whitney. That airplane first flew in 1974, and eventually there would be four prototype B-1s. Um, those were known as the A model or the B-1A. The B-1 was canceled, the program was canceled uh, by President Carter with the approval of Congress in 1977. Um, President Carter um, believed that the B-1 was too expensive and that the same um, requirements could be met much more uh, cost effectively by putting cruise missiles on the B-52, which interestingly became some of the work that I was involved in in the Air Force a few years after that. The um, airplane, however, the B-1 program didn't totally end. There was some continuing flight test activity, and uh, that continued into uh, around 1981. In 1981, there was a change in administration again, some very complicated politics, and the B-1 program was revived under President Reagan as the B-1B. The B-1B um, um, was, a, was a derivative of the B-1A. It was generally the same aircraft. However, there were a lot of uh, improvements uh, that had happened uh, over the years. So, it was more, it was, uh, for example, it had a more capable electronic countermeasures system. It had a newer radar. Uh, some also, the offensive avionics system was considerably upgraded. The B-1B first flew in 1984. It entered service with the United States Aircraft, with the United States Air Force in 1986. And the last of 100 B-1Bs was delivered in 1988. Um, that airplane was designed primarily for the nuclear uh, deterrent mission. However, with the end of the Cold War in 1991, there wasn't much of a need for the nuclear deterrent mission. And the question was, what do we do? We have 100 B-1s, by that time a few had crashed, but let's say we had, I think it was 96 B-1s. And what do we do with this airplane? Because it's a new airplane, it has a lot of capabilities, we spent a lot of money on it, but the mission really didn't exist anymore because nuclear deterrence against the Soviet Union didn't matter when there was no Soviet Union. The, the answer was to transform the airplane into a long-range precision uh, strike platform using conventional weapons and eventually uh, precision-guided munitions. Um, the development of, of conventional capabilities uh, for the B-1 continued through the 1990s. The airplane was first used in combat in 1998 against Iraq and then in Kosovo in 1999. Uh, by 2001, the B-1 was equipped with what was called JDAMs, or Joint Direct Attack Munitions, which were GPS-guided bombs, and that was very fortuitous 
because um, in 2001, the United States went to war against uh, uh, terrorism in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. And then the B-1 continued to be a, a mainstay of U.S. Air Force conventional strike capability throughout the global war on terror. The B-1's also been used for a, a forward-based presence, both in Europe and in the Pacific, uh, the Asia-Pacific region. And that has been uh, focused on deterring uh, aggression by potential adversaries in those theaters of operation and uh, providing some assurance to uh, regional partners and allies. So after all, remember, this is a program that's that goes back, if you will, to the 1950s of how are we going to replace the B-1? Um, first flew in 1974, canceled in 1977, revived in 1981, operational in 1986. And here we are in 2023, and the airplane is still in first line service. It should be in service for about another. There are only 45 of the airplanes that are left in service. The other ones have been retired. Uh, the airplane should be um, uh, in service for about another decade when it's replaced by the B-21 Raider, which is the Air Force's new bomber. However, the B-21 Raider still hasn't flown yet. So we'll see how long the B-1 uh, lasts in service. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I just had a question about the, the B-52. Uh, and uh, you, you just talked about this right now. And um you've worked on this airplane for like quite some time so uh just as you said like uh i mean the b-52 was introduced in i think 1955 um and it's it's been like being used for a very very long time um uh why do you think it's still being used like what's the value of using an airplane which is like uh so so you know? The B-52 first flew in 1952. It first entered service, the B-52B model, in 1955. The only airplanes that are left in service are the um, H models, the B-52H. Those were delivered to the Air Force in 1961 and 1962, so they're airplanes that at this point are over 60 years old. Um, those airplanes are going to be extensively modernized with new engines and new avionics. They're going to be uh, new radars. They're going to be then be redesignated as the B-52J model. The airplane's uh, uh, one of its outstanding characteristics, which is also an outstanding characteristic of the B-1, is that the airplane has been very able to be updated and, sure. and, and therefore has proven to be adaptable and enduring over the long term. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, like, so just as like a follow up question, like, I think in 2014 as well, uh, starting in 2014, like, um, some of its systems got uh, upgraded through the Connect program. Uh, so, whenever like you are upgrading, or whenever the Air Force is upgrading the avionics systems or the engines, um, like, how does this work? Like, how how are they able to readily uh, like sync the flight controls and the avionics through this upgrading process? Well, that's one you you mentioned the connect program, and that's been one yeah. upgrading program. But there have been many, many upgrading programs. For example, back in the 1980s, I worked on one called OAS or offensive avionics system. So 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 they've been uh, there's another one called AMI or avionics uh, modernization initiative. So there have been many, many different um, upgrades of B-52 systems. And you talked about issues have, pertaining to integration, for example. Um, each of those is a development program, you know, starting off with requirements, um, uh, picking a contractor, um, developing and designing it, uh, testing it both uh, in laboratories and in the air in a flight test program. So. Um, it's a continuing series of uh, of uh, of development programs, and and so so it's not just a question of you deliver an airplane and then you're done, but you deliver an airplane and then you have uh, a sets of modernizations, and each of those modernizations is its own program that uh, starts with the requirements and goes all the way through to design, development, and then the actual implementation where you upgrade airplanes. And um, 
So, uh, like the uh, just like you said, like uh, when we were just talking about the B one Lancer, um, there are like a few experimental aircraft which were um, like being developed, and some of them did not end up uh, getting used by the Air Force. And many of the experimental aircraft do eventually um, end up reaching production, and they're used by the Air Force. Um, like based on your experience, like could you briefly explain like what are the parameters by which the Air Force like uh, demands a manufacturer to develop and eventually incorporate an aircraft in its fleet? Well, the Air Force typically what the U.S. Air Force does, and it's no different. By the way, it could be the other services, it could be other countries. The process is basically the same. Is they they define um, requirements. What do they need this system to do? What is the concept of operations? And they will put out what's called an RFP, which is a request for proposal. And companies that manufacture uh, aircraft will uh, respond with proposals. Now, while, while the Air Force has been developing the RFP, those companies have been developing different concepts. So they'll look at what concepts they've developed, and they'll look at the requirements that are in the RFP or the request for proposal, and they'll issue a proposal. The proposal will have multiple parts. There's typically a management proposal, which is how they intend to manage the program and what is their capability for doing that. There's a technical proposal, which describes the, the, the system that they're going to deliver, um, and then their proposals related to cost and what's it going to cost to do this, both the cost, the recurring cost of the item, as well as the the uh, cost of development. And then there may be uh, other pro uh, things pertaining to things like intellectual property transfer, um, uh, risk management, whatever the customer is looking for. Um, the Air Force will then um, take those different proposals and they, and they will, if you will, score them against multiple criteria, for example, cost, management, technical, and uh, they'll try to figure out which is the uh, proposal that, that best suits their needs. Um, uh, the, and then um, they'll award a contract based on, on which one best suits their needs and go ahead. Now, of course, this is a very complicated thing because in, in our country, it's not just the Air Force that gets to decide this. Um, yeah. Countries have priorities. Um, um, Congress needs to appropriate the money and authorize the programs. Um, any given program um, is, is not a lock. It needs to compete against not only other military programs, but um, it has to compete against um, other national priorities. For example, um, the United States is heavily in debt right now, so is this something that we can afford? Is this something we want to pay taxes for? What about domestic needs? So um, there's a real question about whether uh, programs can go ahead based on all these factors. Uh, eventually, if a program does go ahead, um, it ends up with prototypes being built, which need to be tested. and before the Air Force goes um, authorizes production, and Congress, of course, has to appropriate money for production, then uh, you know the test results have to be suitably positive to show that there's something here that has the potential. Now, one of the complicating factors is that is that you can't wait to start production until after you've completed testing; otherwise, it would take uh, many, many decades. So. You have to start production um, uh, before you've completed testing. So the question is, what do you need to know from testing to have enough confidence to go ahead with production? Okay. Okay. And uh, so, um, like you just talked about, like the B twenty one Raider, uh, just a few minutes ago, and this is like uh, expected to be like the most advanced stealth bomber in the world. Um, and uh, it's got like uh, based on whatever is like public domain, it seems like um, Northrop Grumman is really pushing the project forward uh, and they're trying to make the airplane as uh, capable as possible. And um, I'm definitely really excited to see uh, the launch of this uh, aircraft. Um, what are you most excited about with regards to what's what's to come in, in aerospace? Well, I think one of the interesting questions, we'll just take the B-21 as an example, and then and I'll answer your question then more generally for aerospace. Um, 
I think that for the B-21, um, it's replacing two aircraft, the B-1 and the B-2, which are both quite old. I mean, the B-1, you're talking about airplanes that are nearly 40 years old, the B-1, the B-2 airplanes that are about 30 years old. So airplanes of that age become um, uh, very expensive to sustain. Spare parts are no longer available. Um, so, so not only is there a potential increase in capability, but at least there's a potential that operations and maintenance costs, which over the life of, a, of an aircraft can often be more expensive than the acquisition cost of the aircraft. Um, can the B-1, um, excuse me, can the B-21 by replacing the B-1 and the B-2 uh, reduce the sustainment operations and maintenance costs of the Air Force, which are very, very high. Um, more generally, um, what are, you know, when you talk about um, new directions in aerospace, I think there are a lot of interesting new di directions in aerospace at this time that we look at. One of the interesting directions is, is urban air mobility, which are essentially these electric BTOL aircraft. And the question there is, um, are, um, are those aircraft, uh, we know that they can fly, but do they provide a useful capability? Is there a business model that works for those? Um, that's something certainly we're going to keep an eye on. In terms of um, airliners, um, we have uh, major concerns about the effect of aviation on climate change on, on the planet. And so how are we going to have a sustainable model for uh, airline travel? Uh, when we say a sustainable model, that generally means generating less uh, greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide. So uh, we're looking at simply more efficient aircraft. We're looking at aircraft that burn things other than um, traditional uh, jet fuel. That could either be something called sustainable aviation fuel, or it could be hydrogen, perhaps. I don't think you're going to see electric used for uh, large airliners. I don't think the physics on that worked out. But, you know, uh, there's going to be efficiencies in multiple ways, burning less fuel because you have uh, lighter airframes, because you have lower drag, because you have optimized trajectories. Um, so uh, uh, better air traffic control that enables airplanes to not have to, uh, can, that can basically fly in a straight line and so burn less fuel. So um, the whole sustainability um, a set of issues with commercial aviation is going to be something that's going to be really keeping engineers occupied over the next generation, at least. And then we get to military systems, and um, this could be a period of some revolution in military systems. Military aviation, although in many ways is very advanced, in other ways, if you look at military aviation um, and its basic things like fighters, bombers, transport aircraft, um, you have things that, even though they're much more advanced, but the basic concepts and categories are, are World War II at the latest. Uh, the, the question is, are we looking at, I mean, after all, we have a B-1 today or we will have a B-21 soon, but we had B-17s and B-24s in World War II. The question is, are we looking at a, a major revolutionary change where we move from platforms that are conceptually the same as they were in World War II, although, of course, they're much more advanced, to a new generation that include much more heavily based on automation, robotics, um, uh, data links, so that things can be controlled remotely. And we see major new concepts rather than simply applying technology to existing concepts, better technology to existing concepts. So there's a lot there. Of course, since, you know, if you want to further go on, you have uh, space and, um, you know, we're seeing some very interesting developments in, uh, in uh, space. Um, it used to be that getting into space was so expensive that uh, that dramatically limited your opportunities. But now as we're getting into uh, uh, rockets, like, for example, the reusable Falcon 9 from SpaceX, um, routine, low-cost access to space seems to be um, uh, here, not just coming, but here. And if we can get routine, low-cost access to space, that allows us to do a lot of things that we've never been able to do before. So I think that, um, um, you know, the, uh, there's some very interesting times coming in space. In fact, they're here today.
Okay. Okay. Yeah, like, um, uh, yeah, like e Elon Musk is definitely uh, working very, very hard towards ensuring that um, even Starship uh, succeeds soon. And like, I think, like, he's one of the few individuals, like, he's one of the individuals on the planet who's uh, aggressively trying to, uh, like, make um, reasonable space flight an everyday thing. So. Um, well, SpaceX is yeah. the most um, uh, well-known example, but you see other companies that are also advancing. For example, United Launch Alliance is going to be uh, flying their uh, Vulcan rocket soon. Um, you've got interesting things from other companies like Blue Origin and some, some smaller outfits. So, um, you know, we could be seeing a, um, a major advance uh, with low-cost access to space uh, impacting that field. Um, yeah, so uh, I just had like one uh, one final question uh, before before we end today's episode. So uh, you've been working in like aerospace for like uh, quite some time as an engineer um, and you have also worked for for the Air Force. So um, what what kind of advice would you want to give to people who uh, would want to become aerospace engineers or um, who who might even want to work for the for the Air Force? Well, uh, one of the things that's always benefited me over my career is is a commitment to continuous learning. You should always be learning new things. Never, never, never just uh, say, well, I've got a degree. OK, now I'm ready to go. That's just a, a yeah. license to start. But you need to continue to be learning new things and following developments and reading and, and going to conferences and whatever else to stay on top of uh, things as they develop because um, things evolve and uh, yeah. you don't want to just be dependent on what you learned uh, however many years back so be a continuous learner over your career okay sure yeah um yeah yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kenneth, for co coming on my podcast. Uh, and and uh, thank you so much for um, accepting my invitation. And uh, yeah, this uh, I'll have this episode published uh, soon on my channel, and then um, I'll be sending you the link as well uh, once I finish editing it. Well, it's a pleasure, and I look forward to uh, watching it. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.